All right, class, welcome back. Um, here's your exam from last time. Uh, when you look at something like this and you see that is a square and this is a perfect square, you want to ask yourself, does this fit the 2AB? Remember, if it's A plus B squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. So Y, Y squared. So here, A is the same as Y. 49 is 7 squared. So your B is seven. So does this middle part, the 14 Y, is it the same as the two, the A and the B? If it is, in which case it is, two times seven is 14 Y. So because it fits this pattern, right? You have the A squared, the B squared, and the middle is the two AB. We know that this is A plus B squared. So A is Y, B is 7, and we're done. Okay. Now down here, let's try this again. Uh, let's see, 25Y squared, that's 5Y squared. And 4, 2 squared. Let's see uh, if this middle one, the 25Y, fits. Uh, if I put 2, the A is 5Y, and the B is 2, are these equal? Uh, 5 times 2 is 10, times 2 is 20. This is 20Y. It needs to be 25Y. So we can't use this method. All right, this is not a perfect square. So what we can do though, is we can try the AC method. This thing might be factorable. If I do A times C, 20 times, 25 times four is 100. You need two numbers that multiply to give me 100. B is 25. So I need these two numbers to add to give me 25. If I start thinking about all the numbers I can multiply to give me 100, uh, 20 and 5. They multiply to give me 100. They add to give me 25. So that tells me, take this 25y and rewrite it as 20y plus 5y. P and Q here. And now I can do grouping. I'll group these. First group, I could pull a 5y out. So these need the 5y plus 4, right? There's 20y. And I need to write this as something times 5y plus 4. Since it's already 5y plus 4, I'll write it as a 1 times 5y plus 4. So I have a 5y and a 1. And they're both being multiplied by. 5y plus 4. And we're done. Are there any questions? All right. Here is your quiz for today. All right. This one's a little, a little more complicated. Try all the techniques you've learned. All right. Factor out your GCF. Uh, look for perfect squares. Uh, look for the difference of two squares and use the AC method if you have to. We'll take uh, 10 minutes here. All right, class. Let's see what we can do with this. Um, First thing we want to do is see if there's a GCF. Is there something we can factor out of the whole thing first? First, we look at the numbers, the coefficients. 64 is divisible by 4. So I know I can get at least a 4 out of both of these things. Now we look at our variables. We just have x here. 
they both have at least one X. So I know I can get a four X out of everything. And that would leave me with an X to the fourth, right? There's my X to the fifth and a four. I need a minus. Now four times uh, 16 gives me 64. So there's my 64 X. That's the first step. Now I need to break this thing down. There's an X to the fourth, so I could possibly get four factors out of this thing. Um, I noticed that X to the fourth is a square. It's X squared squared. And 16 is four squared. So I have my four X. This is the difference of two squares. Remember, uh, a squared minus b squared is a plus b times an a minus b, right? You got the a squared, the negative b squared, the ab and the negative ab cancel one another out. So let's use that here. So this thing is going to be an x squared minus 4 times an x squared plus 4 because it's the difference of two squares. This one, we cannot factor the sum of squares, but this is the difference of two squares again, right? We could write that as x squared minus two squared. So this being the difference of two squares, we can turn this into an x plus two times an x minus two. And then we still have this x squared plus four hanging around. And then we're done, because this cannot be factored. Remember, the sum of squares cannot be factored. There's the first one. That was a fifth degree polynomial. This one here, number two, it's only fourth degree, but we have four terms here. Um, let's look at our GCF here. The numbers, the coefficients, they're all divisible by two. So I know I can pull a two out and they all have at least one X. Let's factor that out. That would leave me with an X cubed, right? Two X to the fourth. To get this dude, I would need a two X squared. X squared and X gives me X cubed. Two and the two give me the four. Now I need a minus two X squared from a two X. I'd need to have a minus X. This times this gives me a negative 2x squared. And for the last one, I have a 2x. I need a negative 4x. So I need to multiply that by a negative 2. That'll give me the negative 4x. So now what can we do? Um, we want to factor this. It has potentially three factors because it's an x cubed here. Um, we can, let's try to factor by grouping. I group this and this separately. Out of the first terms, let's see, I can pull out an x squared. Is the quiz or exam? Oh, this is a quiz. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is our daily quiz. Thank you. There we go. All right, let's see. Out of these two terms, I can pull out an x squared, and that gives me an x plus 2. Can I turn this into something times x plus 2? I could turn it into a minus 1 times x plus 2. All right, so I so have this 2x. This says I have an x squared and a minus 1 both be multiplied by x plus 2. But now we need to look at this. This has a squared in it. We might be able to factor this. 1 is the same thing as 1 squared. This is the difference of two squares. And the difference of two squares says this would be an x plus 1 times an x minus 1. And then we still have our x plus 2. And then we're completely factored. There are no x squared or x cubed anyway. So we just used kind of everything we knew. We pulled out a GCF. We factored by grouping. And then we used the difference of two squares here. All right, any questions?
Okay. Let's see. We are in 10.3, I think, is where we left off. 10.3, yeah. Let's work some problems from here for our review. Let's take, uh, there's only 10 problems. Let's take number four here. Let's see what's going on here. Solve the equation. All right. We want to do lots of these. Solving is something we do a lot in math. You want to get good at it. Okay, there's y's in two different places. These fractions suck. Let's get rid of them. Let's multiply everything by 10, because 10 is both divisible by 5 and 2. So if I do that, 10 times this thing, 10 over 5 is 2. 10 over 2 is 5. 10 over 5 is 2. 10 over 2 is 5. Okay, so we got rid of the fractions. We just multiplied everything by 10. Let's get rid of these parentheses. If I distribute, I have a 4y minus 10. All right, now uh, we can get our y's together. I got y's here and y's here. If I get rid of the y's on the right, um, then I'll have 2y. We can combine that equals 5. So I want to get the y by itself. Let's get this 15 away from our y. And now we need to get the y. We got to get rid of this 2. So y is equal to 10. All right, any questions about this one? Let's do. Another one here. Solve the equation. Um, this one has fractions. I can multiply everything by six to get rid of the fractions. Six over six is just one. So one times this, right? The six over the six cancel each other out. The six over the three gives me a two. So let's get rid of the parentheses. Two x plus two. So we need to get our x's together. Let's get rid of the x's on the right. That gives us a three x. We want the x by itself. Let's get rid of the 16. And now to get rid of this three, we just need to divide. 18 over three is six. All right, stop me if you have questions. 25, 26. Let's keep going All right, this one has fractions. We can get rid of every, all the fractions by multiplying by three. That gives us a 6c plus five. And be careful here, there's really parentheses. They don't write the parentheses, but it's implied. You're multiplying here everything by the minus. So three over the three will cancel, but we still have this minus. Minus goes to everything. And four times three is 12. Get rid of the parentheses. Now we can combine the C's here. 6C and minus 3C gives me 3C's. 5 and 1 makes 6. So let's get rid of this 6. And now to get, uh, get rid of the 3. Mm-hmm. 
All right, this one's tricky again because because of that minus again. There's an implied parenthesis here. Uh, if we're going to get rid of these uh, fractions, we're going to have to multiply by 21. It's the smallest number that's divisible both by 7 and 3. So 21 divided by 7 is 3. And then 21 divided by 3 is 7. 21 times 2 is 42. All right, you see that 21 over 3 leaves me with the 7, and we still have a minus. Okay. So now let's get rid of the parentheses. This gives me a 6p plus a 33. This gives me a negative 7p plus 14. All right, let's combine the p's. That gives me a negative p. If we combine these, that would be... 30, 47. So now if we get try to get the P by itself, let's get rid of the 47 here. So this is a negative five. So multiplying both sides by a minus one, P has to equal five. These are important. I'm just going to work all of them. All right. So let's see here. To get the A by itself, let's get rid of this 2.7. And this gives us what? 46, 47, 48, 49. So divide both sides by 9.8. A equals 49 divided by 9.8, whatever that is. Uh, we can use our calculator here. 49 divided by 9.8 is 5. All right, let's see, we got M's everywhere. Let's collect them over here since that's smaller. If I subtract 0.05M from both sides, I get 0 0.6. 0 0.25 minus 0 0.05 would be 0 0.20. All right, so here's our M's. Let's get rid of this 20.6. Twenty point six and point six would be twenty one point uh, two, right? Point six and point six is one point two. So yeah, and over here we have zero point two m. So to get the m by itself, by both sides by point two. So. 21.2 divided by 0 0.2 is 106. Of course, you can always check your work, plug that number in and make sure both sides are equal, okay? On an exam, you always wanna check your work so you get full credit for everything, you know? Uh, I forgot which one that was, was it this one? Mm. This one looks different. Might be the same one, but we'll see. Um, so we have C's in two different places. Collect them over here. If I subtract 0.04C from both sides, that goes away. 
0.24 minus 0.04 is 0.20. All our C's are here now. So let's get rid of this 19.6. 19.6 and 0.6 gives me twig. What is this? That's 1.2 or 20.2. Okay, um, now to get the C by itself, let's get rid of this. The C is 20.2 divided by 0.2, which is 101. That's 39, 39, 40. Okay, well, this one has fractions and decimal. That's okay. Um, let's get rid of the fractions. If I multiply everything by 10, because both two and five divide into 10. Let's see, 10 over five is two times two is four. 10 times 0.3 is three. 10 times 2.4 is 24. 10 over two is five. All right, uh, let's get the, all the Bs on the left. So let's add the five B to both sides. That gives me nine Bs. To get the B by itself, let's get rid of the three. That gives me a negative 27. So to get B by itself, divide both sides by nine. 27 divided by nine is negative three here. So 65, and that's it for 10.3. Now we need to go to 10.6. Um, oh. What the hell? Uh, all right, I guess I have to Click all these buttons again. Modules, Alex, load Alex. Okay, ten point six. There we go. Right here. All right, so this is easy. All right, uh, we see this stuff a lot in physics and engineering. We went in by itself to so divide both sides by RT. So N is equal to PV over RT. This is a ideal gas law. PV equals N RT. Uh, this is the number of molecules. This is a constant. Sometimes they call these two together K. Pressure, volume, temperature. So this is a... Um, uh, proportionality constant. 
okay uh, one way of saying this is so if you increase uh, how can I say this uh, if I increase the volume this gets bigger right this doesn't look right uh, right if i now if i decrease the pressure yeah this isn't the ideal gas ball this is wrong because if i increase the pressure the temperature should go up because then the molecules are closer together and they're bumbling into one another more and that would raise the temperature if i raise the volume that would lower the temperature oh no i guess that's why they use these letters why would they throw that in here? I don't know. If you increase the temperature, the pressure would increase. If I increase the pressure, the temperature increases. Yeah, that makes sense. But if I increase the volume, eh, it doesn't work out. Let's see. Yeah, maybe my brain isn't working. I mean, these are working. Uh, I'm saying temperature is proportional to pressure times volume. At a constant volume, temperature and pressure are proportional to one another. If I increase that, this increases. Right? If I decrease temperature, pressure decreases. That's why when it gets cold, your tires go flat <laughs> right there. Okay, because when the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down because of the ideal gas law. Uh, I forgot which one that was. Uh, it's like a 21 here. Solving for Q. All right, these, oh, I, there's just more letters in here. Basically, when we solve for Q, it's going to depend on P, right? To get Q by itself, we just subtract 5P from both sides. So Q is negative 2 minus 5P. So in this case, P is still a number, Q is a number. What Q is depends on what P is. So. Q here is a function of P. 21. Y'all are STEM majors. That's cool. I was just getting started out. Y'all are going to learn so much incredible stuff in college. This is what's going to allow you to understand it. We want y by itself. Here's the y. So let's get everything else to the other side. Now I need to get the 5 out of the way. Divide both sides by 5. So you could leave it like that. Or, or you could say 10 over 5 is 2. And then right, either one of these is correct. Right, so they're the same thing. 23, 24, um, 27, 28. Solve for Y is Y. Get the x's to the other side. Now let's get this minus four out of the way. So you have here eight minus five x over a negative four. This is correct, but this minus down here kind of sucks. Right? You could bring it here, right? which is the same thing as that. 
and then we can bring it in there. This is a negative eight plus five x over four. All right, all I did was take the minus and put it on the top instead of the bottom. But up at the top, you have to distribute it. And we could write this eight over four is two, then five fourths x. So these are the same as this. Those are all equal, including that. You can write it any way you want there. These are these are all correct. Okay. Twenty seven, twenty eight, and uh, songs we have. We got a lot of them. Okay. We'll do every other one then. Solve for D. There's the B, right? So first off, let's get rid of the parentheses. Right, distributing the P. We want D by itself. So let's get this 8P away from it. So we hit A minus 8P equal to PRD. Now we just want the B by itself. So let's divide both sides by P R. So D is A minus 8P over PR. If you wanted to, you could write this as A over PR minus 8. P over P cancels and you just have an R. I like this one better, but they're both technically correct. Thirty one. 38. It's all for you. There's our you. Um, let's multiply both sides by nine. If I did that, I would get a nine Q equals U plus W plus V. So now to get the U by itself, let's get rid of the W and the V. The U here is 9Q minus W minus V. 38. Two parts to this one. The perimeter of a rectangular garden is 38 feet. Let's call this length width. Length width. So twice the width and twice the length should add up to 38. That's the perimeter. Okay. The length is one more foot than the width. The length is the width plus one. This is a system of two equations with two unknowns. And the simplest way to solve these is by substitution. We take L here and replace it with a W minus one. I get this. This is a new equation built from these two that only has W in it. So we can solve for W. So if I get rid of the parentheses, I get this. I'm distributing the two. Combining the W's, I got that. Subtracting two from both sides, I get this. Divide both sides by four. And what is this? Uh, nine, right? So W is nine. Now that I know what W is, 9 plus 1 is 10. That's what L is. 
So that's how you solve systems of two, uh, two equations with two unknowns, right? If, if, you, if you wanted to, if we graphed this, it would be a line. And if we graphed that, it would be a different line. And this point right here is where they'd intersect at nine, 10. That was 41 to 47 here. The triangular, triangular parking lot has two sides that are of the same length and a third side and the third side is eight meters longer so that's our setup find the length of the sides oh if the perimeter is 83 so we'd have x plus x plus y has to equal 83. So we have two equations here. Okay. Two equations with two unknowns. Uh, so we can substitute y is x plus 8. So if I replace that y there with an x plus 8, I now have a new equation made from the other two that only has x in it. And I can solve for x. 2x and x is 3x. If I subtract 8 from both sides, I get 75. Divide both sides by 3. 75 divided by 3 is 25. 25 and 8 is 33. The y here is 33. All right, so if you think about it, all right, check your work. 25 plus 25 is 50 plus 33 is 83. And Y needs to be eight more than X. Well, 33 is eight more than 25. Forty-seven. Okay, two angles are complementary. That means they add up to 90 degrees, okay? Add up to 90 degrees. Uh, so that tells us, let's call them X and Y. That's add up to 90 degrees. One angle is four degrees less than the other. So one angle, four degrees less than the other. So here's our two equations with two unknowns. We can replace y with x plus four. That gives us x plus x minus four. So now we can solve for x, all right? So these two combine to give us that. x and x is two x. Add four to both sides. Divide both sides by two, get 47. I know what that is. I can plug it in right here. This is 47 minus four, which is 43. And that's our y. Two equations with two unknowns. You substitute one equation into the other to get a third that only has one variable.
two angles are supplementary. Uh, I gotta look up the definition of these. I forget. Let's see. What are supplementary angles? Okay, that means they add up to 180. So it means x plus y is 180 as opposed to 90. Okay, remember there's 90, so 180. Uh, make a a revolution, <laughs> half a revolution. One angle is three times as large as the other. One angle is three times as big as the other. So we have two equations with two unknowns. We can substitute. If we replace y with the three x, we have equation with only x's. Three x and x is four x. Divide both sides by four. Uh, uh, let's see. Nine, 45. All right, I divided by two and then two again. Four is two times two. Nine, 180 divided by two, 90 divided by two again is 45. So this is going to be three times 45, which is 135. I think 90 and 45. Yeah. There's your y. Again, substitution. Oop, get a new equation with only one variable. Sixty-two, sixty-three. Work all of these. I don't know, maybe every other one. They get repetitive after a while. Let's see here. The largest angle in a triangle is six times the smallest angle. Okay, so the smallest angle is called x. The middle angle is three times the smallest angle. Given that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180, find the measure of each angle. Okay, well, we know that x plus 3x plus 6x has to equal 180. All right, there's only one variable here. One and three makes four, and six makes 10. Therefore, x has to be 18. Knowing what x is, 3x is 3 times 18. Uh, what is it? Three times eighteen. Uh, Thirty-six. Forty-six. Fifty-four. All right. And this one to be six times eighteen. Uh, which would be twice three times eighteen. So it'd be a hundred and eight. These are all degrees. There we go. There's number fifty-seven. Find x and measure of each angle. This is 90 degrees. Okay. Um, we know that these all have to add up to 180. So 90 plus 2x plus 6 plus 4x has to add up to 180. I subtract 90 from both sides and combine my x's. 2x and 4x is 6x. 180 minus 90 is 90. Subtract 6 from both sides. Now divide both sides by 6. And, 
know what that is. Let's see. 84 divided by 6 is 14. So, uh, no, x is just 14. The degrees is already here. So this is 4 times 14 degrees. 56 degrees. This one, 2 times 14 plus 6 degrees. That's what, 28 and 6 is 34 degrees. There we go. 61 and 62. And we have, uh, I have a check mark there. 11, 13, 14. How many days do we have left? We have, um, Let's do the circle one time. There's what today, next Tuesday, and then maybe one more day. And maybe we'll do, maybe I shouldn't do all of these. Find the area of the circle. The area is pi r squared. That's the formula for the area, all right? For pi is 3.1415, something, 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 something. Um, if all the way across is 10, then the radius is 5. This is 25 pi. Now, you could plug this into your calculator and round it to any decimal you want. But in the real world, we leave our answers in terms of pi. Uh, this is odd. We don't need pi at all. The volume is length times width times height. Since they're all the same, right? You have meter times meter times meter, which gives you meters cubed. Whatever this is, you just plug it into your calculator. You don't need pi at all. Pi is used for things that are circular. Seven. Eleven here. All right, this one. What is the volume of this? Well, this has an area, pi r squared, and then you have a height. The volume is going to be the area times the height. Okay, so it's going to be pi r squared. So h here is 6, right? I'll just write it. Height. So r is 3, and h is 6. 9 times 6 is what, 54? So our volume here is 54 pi. Diameter of a golf ball, the ball, the diameter is 1.6 inches. So the radius would be 0.8 inches. Find the volume. Uh, the volume of a ball is what, 4 thirds pi r cubed. If you're looking for a volume, you better have a length times a length times a length. So you end up with the right units. All right, so you have 4 thirds pi. And the radius here is 0.8. And you have inches times inches times inches. 
All right, you just plug that into a calculator. Twenty. Find the volume of the solid. Okay, well, we have two different volumes here. All right, this dude, um, let's see, what is this? This thing's round, right? So it's more like, uh, Give it a different angle here. We need to know. Okay, well, if we know from here to here is 12, that means from here to here is 6. So the radius is 6, right? So for the first part, let's call this volume 1 and volume 2. The first volume is a cylinder, right? It's the area times the width. So we're going to have like the area of the front circle times the, the width. So the area being pi r squared uh, is we have the pi. R here is 6. And I should put my inches. What is it? 6 inches squared. And then the width is 2.5 inches. So that's volume one. Let's see, six times two and a half, that would be 12. And another three is 15. 15 pi, we have inches squared times inches, that's inches cubed. Volume two, again, it's going to be the area times the width. What is the area of this circle here? All right, well, the radius is half the diameter. So the area is pi times four squared. That's our pi r squared. That gives us the area, but we want a volume, so we have to multiply it by 5.5. Let's see, four times five is 20, and another half of four would be 22. Oh no, this is, this is wrong. Uh, 16, Squared. Both of these are wrong. 16 squared times 2.5. Uh, sorry, 6 squared times 2.5. That's 36 times 2.5. This is 93.6. And here we have 16 times 5.5. This is 88. And we have a pi. And I forgot my units. Never forget your units. This is inches. This is inches. We need inches cubed. All right. So the total volume is the sum of the two. We got 93.6 pi inches cubed and 88 pi inches cubed. So 88 and 93.6. This is 181.6 pi inches cubed. Let's say I type this in the calculator wrong as well. 6 times 6 times 2.5. 90. I don't know how I, I must have hit the wrong button. That 6, six times 6 times 2.5 is 90. I'm wondering if we shouldn't get ugly numbers. 90 and 88 is 178, 178 pi inches cubed is your total volume. All right, anytime you have a cylinder, all right, you have an area and a length, so the volume is going to be your area times your length. Six. That's it for 
16.6. Now we're going to 11.2. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a thousand of them. Okay, fine. Pick one here. Oh, I don't want to do tables. All right, we'll fill in the table here. Um, complete the tables. Graph the corresponding ordered pairs. Draw the line defined by the points. Represent all the solutions. Well, if x is negative 4, replace x with a negative 4. That gives you 4 plus y equals 3. Subtract 4 from both sides. We get a minus 1. So that is one particular uh, solution. Uh, we could... They want us to graph that. Okay, if these are my x's and here's my y's, if I go back one, two, three, four, and down one, that's negative four, one. Sorry, negative four, negative one. All right. Um, they want us to fill out, I'm not going to fill out the table. I'm going to rewrite this as y equals x plus three, moving the x over. So remember, our slope is one, our b is three. When you put it in mx plus b form, you can see that if x is zero, y is three. So zero, one, two, three. There's another solution, right? If I make x zero, y is three. Two points make a line, boom. I'd rather do it that way than fill out a whole bunch of these. This is the smart way to do it, right? The slope is one. Every time I go up one, I have to go over one, up one, over one. Eighteen, nineteen. Go down here. This one's just goofy. Y equals four, four. X is minus one, Y is four. X could be two, Y is four. What does this look like? Here's X, here's Y, one, two, three, four. Every point on this line has a Y value of four. Six, 27. Uh, this is one where they're leading up to graphing. We're not using the tools that we learned. All right. What are the X and Y intercepts? All right. This is your X axis. So that is two, zero. Here's your y axis. This is zero minus four, or zero x and y axis. We could actually, what is the formula for this? Mx plus b. What is the m and what is the b? The b here is minus four, right? I let x be zero, I need to get minus four, right? If x is zero, and x. If x is 0, I need to get minus 4. But what is m? Well, it's rise over run. For every 4 I go upwards, I need to go to the right 2 of 4, right 2. This is 2. So this is 2x minus 4. That's what this line is. All right, found the slope, found the y-intercept. Boom. We know the equation. Every single point on this line will satisfy this equation.
So which one was this? Uh, 46 to 49. Come down here. Um, what is this? True or false? The line x equals four is vertical. X is y. One, two, three, four. Every point on that line has an x value of four. So true. Do two more in this section. Um, all right, this thing, divide both sides by negative two, the same thing as saying x equals four, which is the same thing we just graphed up here. All right, uh, where is the x-intercepts? Well, right here at four, zero is the x-intercept. There is no y-intercept. It's parallel to the y-axis. Not the two more from this section. Select the lines that have a y-intercept. They're going to have a y-intercept unless they're parallel to the y-axis, right? This will have a y-intercept. Uh, this one won't because this is the same thing as saying x equals negative 3 halves. So over here at negative 3 halves, so not that one. This one will, right? This is the same thing as y equals x plus 2. The y-intercept here is going to be 0, 2. Right? This dude here is the same as saying 4y equals negative 2x minus 3, or y equals negative 2 fourths x minus 3 fourths. The y-intercept would be 0, negative 3 fourths. Right? If x is 0, you can see what y is. Right? There's x. If x is 0, you're on the y-axis. Right here, if x is 0, y is 0. This is the same thing as y equals x. If you graph for this one, that's a, your diagonal line. This is y equals x. So it does have an intercept. It's going to be at 0, 0. That's where uh, you cross the y-axis. You know what? You, basically, you plug in zero for x and see what y is, right? If you plug in zero for x on this one, there is no y at all. So that's why this one, you know, it's a para, it's parallel, so, parallel. So, it's seventy-seven. Oops! Dang it! Hit the wrong button. There it is again, 77. And uh, one more, 78. There we go. Store cells compact disk for 1486. Following equations represent revenue, Y, in dollars. I would call it R for revenue. All right, find R when X equals 13. You just plug in 13. That's all you got to do. So R would be 14.86 and 13, whatever that is. So... That's it for 11.2.
Well, we still got a lot to cover here. And I guess we can cover this okay in the next one. We have Tuesday of next week, and then I think we just have like one more day. We either have two or three lectures left. I want to make sure I get through everything. Let's look at 11.3. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them in here. Okay. Pick one out. Another one. Oh, the determine the slope. This is easy. It's rise over run. Um, well, if we go from here to here, the rise is four, and the run goes from negative six to six, that's 12. We could write that as what, one third? For every one I go up, I got to go three to the right, one up, three to the right, one up, three to the right. Piece of cake. 425 to 3338. More on slope. Find a slope passenger. Okay. Where are these points at? Over 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And down five, one, two, three, four, five. Three, 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 negative three. Over one, two, three, down one, two, three. Something like that. The slope is your change in y over your change in x. I could do a minus three minus a negative five. And now let's do the change in x. Three minus six. 5 minus 3 is 2. This is a negative 3, negative 2 thirds. Saying for every 2 I go down, I have to go 3 to the right. Okay. So 3, 8, 69. This one's got a long paragraph to read. Uh, several years ago, the average earning for male workers between the ages 25 and 34 with a high school diploma was 32,000. Comparing this value in constant dollars to the average earnings 14 years later showed that the average earnings have decreased 28,000. Okay, so basically what we have here is here's time. So we'll call several years ago, let's see, whenever that was, we'll call that time zero. So at time zero, we were at 32,260. 14 years later, we're at 20, dang it. 28,200. So at time zero, we're here. 14 years later, we're here. And they're saying, uh, find, find the average rate of change in dollars. So this might look like this, but we can treat it like that. Um, when we're looking for the average rate of change, it doesn't matter if this is curvy or not. Uh, which you'll learn in calculus, okay? So we'll just assume that it, it's a gradual thing, okay? Uh, so we need to find, what do they want us to do? Oh, find the average rate of change. So the slope of this line is the same as uh, the average rate of change of this line. That's what you'll learn in calculus. So if you have something that does that, and, but you want to know the average rate of change. 
just look at the straight line. Okay, so our slope here, our change in y is in whatever, net, what is 32? 32 to 60 minus 28, 200. And our change in x is 14. There's our change in y. Plug that in your calculator, and that's going to be your average rate of change. So 69. Uh, this is all just slope here. One concept change in y over change in x, rise over run. All right, uh, here's the po point two, three, one, two, up one, two, three, no, down three. One, two, three, two, negative three. And we have a slope of one half, meaning for every one I go up, I have to go to the right two. Every one I go up, I have to go to the right two. What would this be if I went up one and I went to the right? Two, add two to two, right? I went up one, and I went to the right two, right? Or I could look at this as down one, left two. This would be zero, and negative four, and so on. That finishes. 11.3. Let's do 11.4 and get out of here. Do, 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 do. There's 500,000 of these. Okay. Four or five here. Identify the slope and in y intercept. We need to put it in this form mx plus b, the slope intercept form. So if I subtract 9x from both sides, I get that. Divide everything by a negative five. Five divided by negative five is minus one. So our slope is nine fifths. A B is minus one. If we're going to graph this. We go down one. For every nine, I go up one, two, three, four, five, nine. Right? One and eight gives me nine. I have to go to the right five. One, two, three, four, five. This is five. And this is zero minus one. There, now we've graphed it. So that's 21, 22, and 33 here. I want to graph this guy. Graph the line through this point that has that slope. So zero minus one. You can tell that this is going to be our B, All right? Uh, they tell us the slope. The slope is five, six. So that's the, the function. If it has a slope of five, six, I have to go up five. One, two, three, four, five. I have to go to the right six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That point there is six, four. Thirty-three. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
down here. 41 to 42. All right, put it in slope intercept and graph it. Okay, subtract 6x from both sides. We can see that the B is 2 and the M is negative 6, also known as negative 6 over 1. We want to graph this. B is 2, 1, 2, boom. The slope says go down 6, go to the right 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, go to the right 1. So at this point here is 0, 2. What is this point down here? See, I was at two and I went down six. Over here, I was at zero, went to the right one. There's the graph. 41, Want to graph this dude? Divide everything by five. All right, there is no b. All right, so b here is zero. Um, b is zero. You can see if x is zero, y is zero. So this thing goes to the origin. Slope is two fifths. So every two I go up, I have to go to the right. One, two, three, four, five. This is five, two. Zero, zero. There's my graph. Forty nine, fifty. Let's do one more. Here. You can always check your work. Type this into some software and have it uh, graph. All right. So on the test, if you have to graph something, put in the MX plus B form, graph it, then use your software to graph it to make sure you've got it right. A phone bill is determined each month by $18 flat fee plus one plus 10 cents per minute of long distance. So here's your flat fee plus 10 cents times the number of minutes is the monthly cost. Here's the graph and what's the question? Identify the slope, interpret the meaning of the slope. All right. Slope is 0.1. Right. What does it mean? <laughs> they tell you what it means. It, it means it costs 10 cents per minute of long distance. Okay. That's what the slope means. Every minute we go to the right, we go up 0.1. All right. What is this? this is one tenth. So, uh, uh, so for every ten minutes, it's going to cost a dollar, right? So every ten we go to the right, we go up one. If we go to the right fifty, we have to go up five. So, boom. All right. Ten minutes for a dollar or one minute for 10 cents. All right, let's, uh, let's see that finishes up on 11.4. We have 13 and 14 to review. So this, and we need an exam now. This will be what, 26. Okay. What do we want to do? Let's pick one out of uh, 14.3, maybe. 
That's already done a lot for 14.4. What was 14.2 about? I'll pick one out of here. A couple of them. Let's just do this one problem here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, we'll just have one problem today on this exam. All right, and that's it for today, folks. I'll see you all on Tuesday.